Someone posted on Facebook a, a phrase this week that just, it, it just epitomized what we're trying to communicate with this immeasurable impact. It's not the size of the splash, but the reach of the ripples. It's not the size of the splash, but it's the reach of the ripples. And Pikes Peak Christian Church has been sending ripples out into the city, into the nation, even into the world. Uh, one of the benefits we have, and it's actually sometimes one of the problems we have, is there's a, there's a lot of turnover in our church because of military transfers. But at the same time, we get to send people out into the world, hopefully stronger, healthier marriage, a deeper faith, when they go to other military installations around the world. And so because of that, we're constantly rippling outward places all over the world. And our missionaries are serving in places all around the globe. The ripples are being felt out. We may not be a splashy church. We might not be big and fancy and make a lot of noise in a single moment. But I just have to tell you, when you step back and look, none of us probably imagine all the ripples that are being sent out through this church with individuals. In fact, someone caught me in the foyer before this service and said, you know, um, since we've been coming to this church, my wife has invited six other people that now attend this church. And it just made me think, how how many of you are in this church because someone in this church invited you? Just raise your hand real high. Wow. It just goes to show you that each of you sitting here can be used by God to send another wave outward. The people that you influence for Christ, the people you touch, the people you minister, and even the people you bring into this church are people that, that God is touching through you. So all of us are doing this together. This is, this is what the church is, and this is what's so exciting about God's church. I want to talk today about the immeasurable impact of a message, because there are hundreds of religions in the world, but there's something very distinct about Christianity, very distinct. And if we're not careful, we may categorize Christianity along with every other religion, say they're they're basically all the same and they basically all teach kind of the same things and they're really all trying to get people to God. But I want to tell you this. There are many religions, but there's only one gospel. And it, it really is the core of who we are. We would not be a church if not for this message. I would not be a Christian if it was not for this message. You know, I have to tell you, growing up, I heard a lot of sermons I doodled during a lot of sermons. I snoozed during a lot of sermons. I, I zoned out during a lot of sermons. Because I heard a lot of messages, but I never heard this one. And once I heard this message, now all the other messages made sense. But this one message that I heard that, that, that really penetrated my heart was what we know as the gospel, the message about Jesus. And once I heard that, it changed everything about every other message. And so I want to talk to you, just share a couple things about this message and why it's so significant. Our faith, our Christian faith, is based on this simple message. Like I said, you can stack all the different religions and you'll have comparative religions and you, you put them all side by side and there's, there's a prophet or some guru and they've got teachings and probably those teachers, teachings have been put in a book and people gather together to hear those teachings. They try to live out those teachings. If they do, they have a better life on earth. Maybe they'll even have a better life in the next life to come and they have rituals they practice and things that are kind of peculiar to their certain set of beliefs and you know, Christianity just lines up with all these other religions because we've got a book and we have a prophet and we have teachers and we gather together and we have rituals like we just saw. I mean, how are we any different than any other religion? The difference is this. Every other religion is a way that we can control by ourselves our destiny by doing certain things to earn favor with the the gods or the spirits. And Christianity, rightly understood, is not about what you do for God. It's accepting what God has done for you. And that is where it makes all the difference. See, people want to take Jesus and say, say, if if we would just learn from Jesus, who was the great teacher, model our lives after his lifestyle, if we would love people like Jesus loved, if we would stand for justice like Jesus did, if we would fight um, corruption in politics like Jesus did, if we would would just live like Jesus did, our our whole world would be changed. And in, in some respects, yes, it would be. It would be far better if people lived like Jesus. But that doesn't address the real problem we have. The real problem we have is something deep inside that isn't corrected by just changing behavior. It's not corrected by uh, adhering to certain teachings. It's something that, that, that requires kind of a spiritual surgery. And so when Paul is reminding the Corinthians, this church full of very worldly people, what saved them, he says it like this, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. 
Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the Twelve. This is the simple gospel message. It's of first importance. It's the most important message you'll ever hear. Jesus died for your sins according to the Scriptures. Jesus was the Lamb that was sacrificed for us. All the Old Testament stories, all, all, of, all of the sacrifices given were to prepare the world for the ultimate sacrifice that was to come, God's own son, Jesus Christ. He died for his sins, which is what the scripture said. Secondly, that he, wrote, he was buried, but that he rose from the dead and that he lives. See, Jesus was, was buried. And Jesus had said that I'm going to go to a cross, I'll die for the sins of the people. But, you know, a lot of people die. A lot of people get buried. So that didn't make Jesus any different. How, how did you really know he died for your sins? I mean, that's a pretty great claim. Jesus says, I died for your sins. I, I die. I'm buried. I hope it worked. I don't know. Did it work? Did he, did he actually die for our sins? Was something removed? I don't know. But then Jesus did what no other man has ever done. He raised himself from the dead. That's what makes him distinct. Not his death, his resurrection. Other people were crucified. They didn't rise from the dead. Only Jesus did. He rose from the dead on the third day, then he appeared to various people over a period of 40 days to prove he was alive. They actually touched him. He was alive. And then he ascended into heaven. And Paul says, this is the gospel by which you are saved if you hold fast to it. This is what I preach to you. And so Paul went around preaching the simple message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He even said, I, I would vow to know nothing among you except this very simple thing that Jesus died for your sins. And so... When the, when the early followers began to go out into the world, they, they didn't teach the whole Bible. They didn't start holding Bible studies. They said, let's start from the very beginning. In the creation, no, he said, let me tell you. You know this Jesus you heard about? Let me tell you what he did for us. He died on that cross. Wicked people put him on the cross, and they buried him. But guess what? He rose from the dead. And, and we are risking our lives to tell you this story. It's what, it's what turned the world upside down. It's what rocked the, the Jewish world. People who have been, just think about it. Jews for centuries, within, think how loyal some of your families are that have been Catholic for generations or Lutheran for generations or Methodist for generations. These people have, have this heritage, God's chosen people. We've been Jews for hundreds of years. And then they decide, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus now. I'm going to follow Jesus and worship the Jesus way. That's, that's huge. And it was causing anger among the religious people. It was causing um, uproars in the pagan culture because people were now, they, they, they stopped buying the pagan things and stopped visiting the prostitutes in the temples. It was just causing this uproar all because of a simple message that Jesus died for your sins. He rose from the dead. Your life can be different with him. And so if you go through the book of Acts and look at the sermons that were preached, it, all, it kept boiling down this thing of who Jesus was and what he had done for them. In Acts chapter 4, it says, And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That's what they went out to do. The resurrection just lit, lit them on fire. They couldn't keep quiet about this message. And what I fear today is that so often this, this message, which by the way is called what kind of news? Good news. You don't get good news unless you first have bad news. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is that you and I are sinners, and sin has separated us from God. If you've been reading with us through the book of Nehemiah, uh, one of the things I love about going through the Bible slowly is I gain things I didn't pick up before. And one of the things I notice in Nehemiah chapter 9 is a prayer. The people actually prayed the history of the Jewish people. They start with creation and they go all the way to their present day when they were in exile. And they look back and say, here's where we went wrong. God, you made this world. You made it beautiful. And, and yet we sinned against you. And, and we were led into Egypt where we were slaves for years. But you heard our cries and you rescued us. And you proved yourself strong and you fed us and water and manna. And you guided us with the, with the fire by night and the cloud by day. You did all this for us. And what did we do? We turned against you. We were stiff-necked and stubborn. And yet you 
led us once again to enter the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, a land that was full of uh, prosperity, and you opened the doors for us to enter and take that land. And what did we do? We turned against you again. We worshiped the gods of the other nations that were supposed to be driven out. And you were disappointed in us. And then we cried out to you when the enemies came in and you delivered us again and again and again and again. Every time we drifted away and we cried out, you would come back and rescue us. God, you've been so faithful to us again and again. And now here they are in exile, recognizing the fact that, God, you've been far more faithful to us than we've ever been to you. And I wonder with us, are we just like them? God's been so good to us. And yet we, we put God on the back shelf and we, we, we like what culture offers us. We like the gods of the culture and, and God just becomes a little piece of our lives rather than saying, God, you're everything to us. We owe everything to you. It's because we all have a problem called sin and sin at its heart is self, selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, when I was in high school, I had a hard time admitting that. That I was a selfish person. That I was a sinful person. Because I always thought I was a good, bo- good boy. Teacher said I was a good kid. I, I was just like, I thought I was a pretty good person. And, and I didn't really understand the fact that if you're that good, you don't need Jesus. Jesus only came for bad people. And you're badder than you think. And uh, the older I get, the darker I see myself. You know, the older I get, I recognize the fact that, man, I am still fighting this selfishness inside. I am still fighting a battle with sin within me. But you know what? It's good to recognize because when I recognize it, I realize I still need a savior. I need someone who can forgive me and cleanse me and get rid of the guilt and shame that comes with sin. And that's why we have to remember again and again, this is what the story is. It's not, as much as fellowship is great, that's not the primary purpose of the church. As, as good as feeding the, the poor and clothing the naked, it's good. That's not the primary purpose of the church. The primary purpose is to tell people the wonderful, amazing story that God still loves you and he's willing to forgive the sin in your life. And that's why at the heart of everything we do, you are reminded of this fact. We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. You know what that celebrates? My body broken for you. My blood poured out for your sins. Every Sunday we're reminded, I need forgiveness. And that forgiveness is provided through Jesus. By the way, Jesus didn't come to say, I'll show you the way. He says, I am the way. I'm not going to show you how to get to God. I'm going to make the way to God. And you just get on my shoulders and I'll take you there. You trust in me and what I did for you on the cross. When, when someone's baptized, we are pronouncing those, the gospel in a visible form. Jesus, who died, was buried, was raised from the dead, is reenacted every time someone's baptized. We're proclaiming the fact, I do believe Jesus died on a cross. I do believe he was buried, and I believe he was raised and he lives. Every time someone's baptized, it's a proclamation of that very simple message, the gospel. The reason we meet on Sunday, first day of the week, do you know why we do that? It's resurrection day. The people who had been worshiping on the Sabbath for generations said, you know what? Such a dramatic thing has happened. We are going to remember the resurrection by meeting on the first day of the week and worshiping. It wasn't a command. God never commanded them to worship on that day. It was just a response. We don't ever want to forget the fact that this is why we're together. The resurrection is the the bonding agent for us. And so we have this incredible story. The Bible calls the gospel. And it is embedded in our DNA as a church. You know, I remember, since I've been here, some of the most exciting times have been watching people get baptized. I remember in the old church, there was a a gal, her name's Denise, and Denise was special needs. Her mother, Uta, would bring her to church on Sunday. And Denise came to a place where she said, I know enough to give my life to Jesus. And so on that Sunday, it was a, just a joyful day for the whole church to watch Denise get baptized. And if, you're, if you guys were in the old church, the baptistry was in the middle. On either side were, were tiny changing rooms. And so the girls were on one side and the boys on this side. And Denise changed in that room and the rest of the service went on. Brian was into his sermon. And then Denise comes out from behind, walks down that aisle there with wet hair and a big grin on her face. And people along the edge of the aisle are reaching up to kind of 
wave, wave at Denise or maybe t- touch her on the shoulder, but Denise just sees that this is a gauntlet. She, she goes running through and she starts high-fiving everybody. And she's kind of going like this. And she's, if you knew Denise, she's got this real deep, ah, yeah, ah, and she's laughing. And, and it was like spontaneous joy in that room. I remember before we moved from that building to this building, it's going to show up in one of the videos, but it is truly one of the most amazing stories. We had been in a campaign to build this building, and it was called Greater Things, and we really believe God wanted to do greater things than we ever imagined if we would just pray and trust him. And so a couple weeks before we were to move into this building, I was preaching through the book of Joshua, and there's a story in the book of Joshua. It's one of those things where when you come to it, you realize, God, can we just skip this story because it's not easily applicable to us. And the more I prayed, I said, oh, this is very applicable to us. It was like the Holy Spirit was telling me this is really applicable to you guys because the story is about Joshua bringing the people into the promised land. But before they go in, God says, you got to take care of some business. See, the none of the men who are who wandered in the wilderness at the beginning made it to the end. They all died except for two, Joshua and Caleb. All the other men now that had raised up had been born in the wilderness days during those 40 years. And God told Joshua, none of those men have been circumcised, which is, which is one of the signs that, that makes God's people unique. So Joshua had to go back and say, guys, got some good news and some bad news. Good news is promised land's right over there, right over beyond Jericho. We're going in. It's ours. God claims it for us. I could just hear this uproar. Yeah! goes, okay, now bad news. Um, Drop your drawers. And I've got my knife right here. We got to take care of some business. I mean, I can't imagine the whole conversation. It had to be really, really awkward and painful because these aren't babies. These are men. But here's the point. God said, this is an act of obedience that should have been done a long time ago. If you're going to obey me over there, you start right here. And on that day, it was just God was telling me that there's a lot of people in our church who've never obeyed God in one of the very first acts of obedience, which is baptism. They've been at church. They believe in Jesus. They've just never gotten in the water. And Jesus said, one of the first marks of a disciple is to be baptized. And so I, I just made the challenge. I said, a lot of you just need to quit putting out excuses of another day or when my, when my family's in town or when it feels good or whatever. And you know what you should do. And today's a day just to say yes to God. Say, I'm going to do it. No excuses. I know what Jesus did for me because the best time to obey the Lord is always right now. And we expected that we'd have, you know, a dozen or more people get baptized. But on that, on that weekend, Saturday night service and the three services Sunday, there were 67 people baptized. And, and if you were in that service, it was incredible. I mean, people just flowed. I mean, even while we worshiped, people were coming down the aisles. The last service, over 30 people walked up and said, today's my day. None of this was planned ahead of time. Nobody knew going in that day, today was the day I was going to be baptized. But 67 people said, I'm done making excuses. And maybe some of you are at that place. Just need to stop making excuses. In this building here, we've had some of my favorites are when the MOPS group comes over or re-engage group comes here or, or the, the FUEL group comes here and celebrates in an intimate way a baptism of somebody within their group. I mean, it is just incredible when someone says, I believe that gospel message. Because we are a community of people who believe that message. Uh, the, the church is built on us who believe that message. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the power of God. There is power in the gospel. When you experience that power in your life, and your life has actually changed, you want to tell people. You want to, you want to share that with other people. And so God says, tell you what, you'll be my witnesses. And a witness tells people what they've seen, what they've experienced. He didn't say, pastors, you're going to be the witnesses. He said, you'll be my witnesses. You are a witness. I'm a witness. Do you know what happens when the whole church owns that responsibility to be a witness? The ripples keep going out. I mean, there are people that you know that you should be inviting to church. There's people you know that you should be telling them what God has done for you through Jesus, the burdens he's lifted, the freedom. You don't have to point fingers. You don't have to judge others. You're testifying to what God has done for you. This is who you once were. This is who you are now. This is what Jesus has done. It's giving him the glory for what he has done in your life. We are a church that should be doing that on a regular basis. It's every believer's job. And I love when 
when someone gets a hold of that and they just run with it. There was a young man who was in our youth group at the old church on Aspen Drive. His name was Jeremiah Holcomb. And Jeremiah's parents got divorced. His mom remarried. And uh, his dad wanted to start taking him to church. So they went to the old church on Aspen Drive. Jeremiah was in elementary school at the time. And he said the church began to teach him the books of the Bible. And he started memorizing scriptures. And then he got into sixth grade, which he said was a life-changing year. Because the teacher in that class was an elderly lady named Mally Whitley. Some of you know Mally. She's legendary here. Um, Mally gave him a Bible, and he still has this Bible today. He says, I began to really fall in love with what was in this book. He said, in, in high school, at a CIOI conference, I committed myself to full-time Christian service. Then he graduated, went to Manhattan Christian College, and then following that, ended up going into youth ministry. Um, then he pastored some small country churches. And three years ago, Jeremiah and his wife and his kids moved to the, the community of Eudora, Kansas, to plant a church called the Refuge Christian Church. We got to help with some initial funding to get that church off the ground, but in three years, they're self-supporting now. They average attendance about 91 on Sunday, and they baptize 17 people and have seven small groups that meet on a regular basis. And Jeremiah um, wrote me this note. He said, I will always consider myself a Timothy of Pikes Peak Christian Church and am forever grateful for her commitment to teaching the foundation of the Bible and salvation in Jesus Christ. I look forward to seeing more great things from Pikes Peak Christian Church in the future. The ripples keep going. We invested in a sixth grade student who fell in love with this book, who gave himself to full-time Christian ministry. Not that that's more glorious than any other profession, but that he said, I've got to tell people this story. I want my whole life to be about telling people this story. It's because of people like you who invested in them. See, we, we need to share this message with the world that's hurting. But you know what? If you've never received it, it's pretty hard to share it. It's pretty hard to testify to something you've not experienced. And some of you are like those people standing on the sidelines saying, I'm still watching and checking it out. I've never fully embraced this message. But I want to take you back to the first sermon that was preached after Jesus rose from the dead. It's found in Acts chapter 2 where Peter's preaching. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You crucified him. You didn't drive the nails in, but it was your sins that put him there. And friends, that includes you and me. You put him on that cross. Lawless men nailed him there, but you and I put him there. But God raised him up, loosened the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So the people were shaken by that. What do we do? What do we, what do we do to get rid of this shame and guilt? He says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. All comes down to a message. Bad news is you and I have sinned, rebelled against a loving, good God. But God loved us so much. He sent his only son to die on a cross so all that guilt, all that shame... All that judgment could be erased and we could be made one with God. And again, receive that love and walk with him, not just through this life on earth, but into eternity. And I'd be amiss if I didn't invite you today to come here and say, today's my day. Today's my day to respond to this good news.